Good morning, or depending on when you're listening to this, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. My name's Ross, and I was always told I had a voice radio, so I've made a podcast all about the Pokemon trading card game, and you're listening to PTCG Radio. Now, I'm hoping this week that you can hear something a little bit different, and I'm hoping it is good different. I have upgraded my audio setup just a little bit, so consider this a bit of a test podcast. I think it's working a little bit better. I think the sound quality should be a little bit better. If it is, let me know. If it isn't, let me know. As always, you can get me on Twitter at the Wossy, or you can email me at ptcgradio at hotmail.co.uk. Rather than using my cheap as you like headset this week, I'm actually on a bona fide microphone, which is in one of them bona fide stands which stops the vibrations or something along those lines. It makes me feel like a proper podcaster slash radio man, rather than some kid doing it in his basement. When in reality, I am not a kid and I'm in a front room, not a basement but it's warmer and drier, so I think that's just a little bit better. We've got a little bit of news this week, we've got some new cards to get to, and then we're going to have a chat about Seismitoad and Manectric. If we've got time, we may not have time for all of them, so let's just say it's going to be Seismitoad or Manectric, however I feel when we get there, assuming, of course, that we have time when we get there. Now, the levels on this were a little bit low when I started. I believe I've fixed this problem. I think it's going to be slightly lower levels than it was before, so some of you may have to turn your iPod or generic music device up just one or two little numbers just to make sure that you're hearing me all well and good but I think this is going to be a little bit better please do give me some feedback on this by the way because if this is rubbish then I'm just going to go back to me old setup because it wasn't perfect and I there are a few audio files out there who told me a few things here and there which I appreciate but it worked shall we say First piece of news this week is that we know what the pre-release Pokemon is going to be, and it is going to be a Kingdra. And that's about it, to be honest. We know the Kingdra. It's a pretty good one. It's the um, it's the one that's got Alpha Growth, so you can attach two energy cards per turn. And it's really got the one good attack, which does 150 damage for two water and a lightning. Assuming, of course, you are happy to discard a water and a lightning in order to actually do the attack. The theory being that you discard a water and a lightning to do 150, but we know, of course, it's probably going to be 170 with a muscle band. And in reality, with this being a non-EX, you can pop a silver bangle on there, and it's going to be doing 180, which, as we know, will one-hit KO any non-water-resistant non-mega-EXs. So it wouldn't work against something like... um, a Verizian, for instance, even if you had a Silver Bangle, because the resistance would bring it down to 160, and Verizian, of course, has 170 HP. Bit of a shame, but hey-ho, that's what you can do. My problem with Kingdra is, as it's been, and I think I've told you about it twice now, or at least once, it's a stage two, and it takes essentially two energy attachments. It takes three, but you can do two of them in one turn. But it's still going to take two turns of energy attachments, let's put it that way, on a stage two in order to be able to get this going. And there's just so many Pokemon out there that are going to be able to kill this before it even gets going. It does have a weakness to Fairy as a Dragon Pokemon rather than Lightning as a Water Pokemon, which helps against things like Manectric. But honestly, ladies and gentlemen, I don't see this as a particularly powerhouse Pokemon, and I'm afraid to say, I mean it looks beautiful, it's one of those three quarter art cards and it looks amazing I just really don't think it's going to be all that in a bag of potato chips when you come to attacking with it, so sorry about that We've also had some new Pokemon being revealed this week, but they're particularly exciting because they are the Team Aqua and Team Magma Pokemon. Now, the Kyogre and the Groudon, they both have the same ability, and the ability is Power Saver. But it's one of these kind of negative abilities, unfortunately. It it hinders the Pokemon on which it appears rather than helps it. The ability reads, if there are less than four Pokemon in play with Team Aqua in their name... This Pokemon can't attack. And it, there is a note on PokerBeach.com, which is where I'm getting these things from. There is a note that the that the ability name is a little bit blurry. Now, as it's read there, and again, these are Japanese cards. We don't have English translations. I'll let you know when we do. But as it reads at the moment, that's free bench Pokemon plus the Team Aqua or the Team Magma. Now, with these ability ones, and we've seen this with Slacking, for instance, several times... Um, so it's really not kind of all that in a bag of potato chips. Sorry, I keep using that phrase. That's twice now. I will not use that phrase again on this podcast. But essentially, you would imagine, oh, they've got this negative ability. They must be hella good. And, I mean, slacking never is. And these ones are underwhelming. Now, before I tell you what the attacks do, I must mention something which has been brought up to me on... um, 
and other people on Facebook and Twitter and all of that over the last couple of days. And that is the fact that actually we don't know what kind of support these Pokemon are going to be getting. And it is entirely likely that there's going to be support Pokemon, trainers, supporters, etc. Which are actually going to then go and make these Pokemon far more viable than they are at the moment. So Team Magma's growled on EX... It's got an ability. It's got an attack, Magma Quake, for free fighting and a colorless, and that is expensive, ladies and gentlemen. Eighty plus damage. If your opponent's active Pokemon has any damage counters on it, this attack does eighty more damage. So it does one hundred and sixty for four energy. If your opponent's already got damage on it, and you can't use double colorless. I cannot be the only person that is not bowled away by the magnificence of that attack. The other thing is, and we'll get updated rulings on this, but the way it used to work with owners Pokemon back in the day when we've had these before was that, for instance, you know, Erica's Gloom evolved from Erica's Oddish. Erica's Gloom did not evolve from Oddish. Now, I could be wrong about this. I don't believe I am. But if anybody knows I'm wrong, please, again, you know, tweet me at the Wassy or email me at ptcgradio at hotmail.co.uk. Or a lot of you have got me on Facebook at this stage. Well, not a lot, but several of you have got me on Facebook. If you're one of those peeps, obviously, you can just send me a message over Facebook. And if you haven't added me on Facebook, maybe you can find me. Maybe I'll add you. Who knows? Anyway, less shameless plugs. Um, I don't think this will evolve into Primal Groudon EX, and to be honest, I don't think you'd really want it to anyway. The regular Groudon EX, I believe, has a moderately okay attack for a fighting and a colourless, and it's better than Nout. Team Aqua's Kyogre, again, it's a water, 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 colourless. It doesn't have um, an ability or a... You know, an alpha growth or anything like that. An ancient trait, I believe they're called. Free water and a colourless energy. 80 damage, plus 20 damage for each colourless cost in your opponent's retreat cost. So against something like a Don Fan, yeah, that would be awesome. But it's already hitting Don Fan for one hit with weakness. So I don't really know what you're going to want to use this against. It's easily countered. It's countered by Floatstone because Floatstone reduces the retreat cost to zero. So you can't really use it against anything that's got Floatstone on. You can't use it against anything with a low retreat cost. You can't use it if there aren't three other um, Team Aqua Pokemon in play. And maybe, you know, even with all of that, if the attack was spectacular, maybe. But it isn't. And I don't think it can evolve, Mega Evolve, into Primal Kyogre EX, which is what you're going to be wanting to use anyway. So, um... I mean, I really would love to go with this. It's, it's just not on the card. It's not a particularly good card. I can only apologise for that. But, you know, I didn't make the card, so maybe I shouldn't be apologising. Maybe you should be apologising to me. Moving on, there are two other cards which were spoiled literally right as I went to start recording this podcast today. Team Magma's Camerupt. And it evolves from Team Magma's Numal, not regular Numal. Just, you know, I think that's something that's worth pointing out. It's got an ability Burn Draft, which is kind of a cool ability. Once during your turn, before you attack, you may choose one fighting or dark energy card from your discard pile and attach it to your Pokemon. So it's got built-in energy acceleration, and we all know, we should know, that built-in energy acceleration is fantastic and spectacular, and we love it. We like built-in energy acceleration. This is good. It's got one attack, though, and it's not... It's alright, actually, it's alright. Because you attack for a fire and a double colourless. What this means is you can use the ability to get the fire energy on him, then you use a double colourless as your energy attachment for the turn, and you're getting him going in one turn, and that's pretty cool. You know, I mean, I've made this clear on the podcast before, I'm a big fan of Pokemon that can go from zero to attacking in one turn. Whether that's something like this that uses the ability and a double colourless energy, whether it's the new Excadrill that can attach two energy in one turn to get going, or whether it's something like a Landorus or a Dugtrio which attaches for a single energy. I like Pokemon that can get going in one turn. It's one of my big knocks on Kingdra. It can't do that, whereas a lot of other kind of equivalent Pokemon maybe could. Now, the attack does 60 damage, and you move a basic energy attached to this Pokemon to one of your benched Pokemon. Now, it's got 110 HP and a weakness to water. It's not amazing. But the theory with um, Team Magma's camera up would essentially be you attach a fire from the discard pile and a double colorless, and you can attach a dark, but you probably wouldn't because you want to get going in one turn. 
you attach a fire from the discard pile to Team Magma's camera up. Then you pop a double colorless on, you do the attack for 60, and you move the fire energy to a benched Pokemon, maybe a Charizard or a Pyroar or something like that. Then next turn, you attach another energy from the discard pile to Camerupt, which then gets popped onto your bench, but then you're essentially attaching an energy to Camerupt and then onto your bench when you attack, and you've still got your energy attachment for the turn that you can use as well, which of course, pretty gosh darn useful. So it's essentially giving you two energy attachments per turn, with the added bonus that if Camerupt gets knocked out, you don't lose that energy, because the energy is going to your bench Pokemon. So... I can see a use for this. It only does 60 damage. Now, it is a fire Pokemon, so you stick a silver bangle on this baby, and you are one hit KOing Virizion or Genesect. So, I can see this as a nice as a nice card in a fire deck. Now, you really need to put something like a Muscle Band or a Silver Bangle. Then, if nothing else, you're two-hit KOing whatever your opponent throws at you, or one-hit KOing if it's grass, or three-hit KOing if it's a Mega Rex. But they're not that well played, so we're going to leave that for a second. There is potential for this camera up. I like the attack. I like the fact that it basically gives you two energy attachments per turn and conserves the energy, kind of like um, Tornadus from Emerging Powers, which is actually still in the format after its Legendary Treasures reprint but hasn't really seen play since CMT um, went to Tornado CX, which was even before it got rotated out, Celebi did. The other card we've got is Team Aqua Sharpedo, which again has an ability, and a pretty nice ability. Once during your turn, you may search your deck for a Pokemon with Team Aqua in its name, show it to your opponent, and put it in your hand. This is a Dark Sharpedo, not a Water Sharpedo. Shuffle your deck afterwards, and again, this may be inaccurate because the text is hard to make out. The attack does 70 for a dark and double colourless, so it's not a very efficient attacker. I see this as more of a support Pokemon. It's universal Pokemon search from an ability, which I think we can all agree is pretty gosh darn tasty. I like it, it's good. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it's pretty cool. It allows you to, um, you know, it allows you to set up. It's a stage one, so you can get this going on turn two. We need better Team Aqua Pokemon. The only Team Aqua Pokemon we've seen are Team Aqua's Kyogre EX and Team Aqua's Sharpedo, neither of which I'd want to attack with. But if we can find some more Team Aqua Pokemon, which I do want to attack with, I think this could start being a pretty tasty card pretty gosh darn quickly. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the news for this week. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about today, really the focus of this podcast, I suppose, is Seismitoad. Now, Seismitoad has been around for a little while, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with Seismitoad. But what's interesting me with Seismitoad at the moment is the sheer variety of ways to play it. But not just a variety of ways to play it. I mean, we're in City Championship season at the moment. Now, I am obviously, you know, I'm going to try and find a collation of City Championship results. And, you know, maybe next week we'll go through a little bit of a what's winning at City so far. But what I've been doing instead so far is not really looking at which decks are the winningest. I mean, spoiler alert, it's Evil Tal, it's Seismitoad, it's Verizian Genesect. I mean, they are the big ones, they will continue to be. There's a bit of Pyral, there's a bit of Aromatis, there are some Anectric decks flying around. But what's interesting me is I've got a lot of Pokemon stuff on my Facebook. A lot of Pokemon friends and Pokemon groups and all of that. And the reason I have all this on my Facebook is my feed turns into kind of about 20% what my friends are up to and 80% what's going on in Pokemon. This is from tournament winning decks to ideas to deck lists. And a lot of it's, I'm not going to lie, a lot of it's rubbish. But what it means is I see an awful lot of posts about winning cities decks. I must have seen... Somewhere in the region of 50 to 100 winning cities decks. The, um, I suppose the, the, what people do at the moment, the tradition is you win a cities and you put your main Pokemon cards next to your trophy and you take a picture and you whack it up on Facebook. And what has been interesting me is a sheer variety of Seismitoad decks that have not only been doing well at cities, but have actually been taking cities down and actually winning them. Now, Seismitoad, for those who've forgotten, is it's a fairly straightforward Pokemon card. It's got a second attack, but most people use it pretty much for the first attack. It's a water Pokemon, it's an EX that gives up two prizes. It's got 180 HP, which is better than 170. It's it's pretty much the maximum for a regular Pokemon EX. I am not looking at you, um, Waylord. You don't count. And that's nothing against Waylord. I'm sure Waylord's lovely. But he's always had more HP than everybody else. So we can't take him as a kind of measuring stick. 
It's weak to grass, which is always a problem because Rizzi and Genesect isn't going away and hasn't gone away. And quite frankly, Rizzi and Genesect, unless you play this with Pyro, is as good as an auto loss. But what Seismitoad has is an attack for a double colourless energy, which goes back to what I was talking about earlier in the podcast. It means you can attack for one energy attachment. You can put up Seismitoad with no energy, whack a double colourless on, and you're attacking that turn. That is good. It does 30 damage, which is a little bit weak, but you stick a muscle band on, that goes up to 50. You stick a verbag down and play a laser, that goes up to 80, and then 110 after their turn. So, you know, 50 damage plus 30 between turns from poison, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And actually, as a random four, I've been playing a fair bit of Seismitoad in various guises. And I don't like having four laser. And you can't play... This is a quick side note about building Seismitoad decks. You cannot play it with Dowsing Machine because you're so reliant on getting the lock-up turn one. More on that in a second if you don't already know. You're so reliant on getting the lock-up turn one, you need the turn one double colorless energy. You need that as quickly as you possibly can. And Computer Search is the only card that really allows you to go for it. So you need Computer Search because it then gives you five outs to a DCE on turn one because you can pull a DCE or a computer search to go and get one, or if you play, you know, two Skylar, then all of a sudden we've got, you know, seven outs to a DCE. You play a Jirachi, and then all of a sudden we've got eight outs to a DCE. Free Ultra Ball to get the Jirachi, to get the Skylar, to get the computer search, to get the DCE. You're going up to, now that's obviously discarding an awful lot of cards, but the point is, the, the, Computer Search gives you many more ways to get that DCE going nice and early, and you really need to for a Seismitoad deck. Now the attack blocks opponents from playing item cards from their hand next turn. And this is huge. It blocks off things like lasers. It stops them playing tools. It stops them using Pokemon Search cards. It stops them using their Ace Spec cards, etc, etc. It basically stops them playing. And that is an absolutely huge advantage. Now they can still attack and they can still play supporters and they can still attach energy cards. But for instance, you're playing against a metal deck. You play a Lissandra, you grab up their Bronzong. Oh, you've got a retreat cost of, I think it's free. Oh, and and you can't use a switch or an escape rope. So you've got to manually retreat. And I'm going to use Enhanced Hammer to get rid of any DCE you put on. Yeah, it, it's it's not going to go terribly well for them, and that's that's what Seismitoad does. But that's, you know, that's not your whole deck. You need something else. Now, the classic Seismitoad list, what most people have been playing with traditionally, is Garbodor. And Garbodor blocks abilities, and hopefully you can see where this deck is going at this stage. You play Seismitoad to block trainers, you play Garbodor to block abilities... And then your opponent can't play trainers, they can't play abilities, they can just attach, attack and use supporters. Something like, go back to a metal deck, not only can they not use trainers, they can't use Bronzong to um, uh, accelerate energy. Oh yeah, and because I've got Garbodor out, my opponent, if they're relying on abilities like a metal deck, they're going to want to use Startling Megaphone. Oh, but you can't because I've locked you from playing trainers. So my Garbodor is going to stay out. And traditionally, everybody's going to Lissandra up that Garbodor and try and kill it, which is fine, because I'm either just going to retreat it with the Floatstone, or maybe if they kill it, but I'm slowing the game down, so I'm going to be setting up two Garbodor. And that's a classic way to play it. And some people choose to play it just like this. And I've seen a bunch of people have success playing it just like this. But the reality is, um, it doesn't really do all that much against a lot of decks. So let's say an Evil Tower deck. And if an Evil Tower deck comes out and it piles a bunch of energy on, and I speak as someone who's played this deck several times in tournaments as well, it's really scary. It's incredibly scary. Because if they can be X-balling you for a one-hit KO, there's nothing you can do. You are not going to KO that evil town. Now, Seismitoad has a second attack, Grenade Hammer, for 130 damage. And, of course, with a Muscle Band Verbank Laser, that goes up to 180 and gets your one-hit KO. It does do 30 damage to two of your bench Pokemon, so that is something to watch. Now, the problem is that that takes free energy attachments, grass, a grass, and a colourless. Excuse me, a water, water, colourless. So either free water or two water and a double colourless. And that's... My opponent is going to be able to two-hit Kiyomi with X-Ball, uh, Evil Ball, before I've got that going. And I can lock them, and I can hit a heads on laser, and they can hit a tails, and blah, blah, blah. But it's a precarious position. So if I put another attacker in there, then I have to break the lock, and that's a problem. 
I think, to be honest, one of the biggest pieces of skill in playing a Seismitoad deck is knowing when to break the lock. I played in a mirror match the other day against Seismitoad, and I had the better start. You want to be playing Headringer, which makes their EXs attach one more energy to, um, to attack. And I'd got going, I'd put a head ringer on him, I'd got my muscle band down, I had the lock, and I was going quite nicely. And I was playing on PTCGO, and I, I was being a little bit gung-ho. And what I did was, I broke the lock to Grenade Hammer to get an early KO. At which point, my opponent used Enhanced Hammer to get rid of my DCE, Startling Megaphone to get rid of my muscle band, popped a head ringer on me, so now I couldn't even use Quaking Punch because it would take free energy to use it. And I could only attach a double colourless energy in one turn. I uh, played a laser to put me asleep, etc, etc. I broke the lock too early. And then I just carried on like I was. I was going to win that game. I got greedy. I tried to accelerate my victory and that was silly because I lost it, you know, and it wasn't even close. Because then my opponent did exactly what I should have been doing all the way along. And if you play other attackers, you break the lock. If I attack with anything else, my opponent is going to get trainers back, and that can be a problem. So there is a little bit of skill involved. However, if my opponent is going to be, you know, attacking with an evil towel and killing me, then I, it doesn't matter about the lock. I've lost the game. If my opponent brings out something like a uh, Verizian or a Genesect and is one hit KOing my Seismitoad, a lot of Verizian decks now playing... Um, you know, things like Deoxys and um, Plasma Badge, not a lot, but a few of them. And then they can one hit KO a Seismitoad using um, uh, Emerald Slash. So, in those kind of situations, I, I need another attacker. Now, one which has seen a little bit of play is Charizard. Charizard for free energy does 60 damage, and it's free colorless energy, so a water and a double colorless will do it nicely. And then you can do 120 damage to a Verizian or a Genesect. But in reality, you pop a muscle band on there, you're doing 160, and then you play a laser and you win. And yes, I am aware, ladies and gentlemen, that lasers don't work against Rizian, but do bear in mind that we're playing Garbodor. Or we can play a laser on turn one of the game to bring them down by even 10 damage before they attach a grass and Vrizian's ability pops in and gets rid of the, um, the poison. But it's still with enough time that they can have 10 damage on, and then I can one-hit KO that for Rizian. But that's not the biggest tech. There are three kind of things you can really play with Seismitoad, which is seeing a lot of play in terms of other attackers. Number one, Pyro. This is a deck which has seen, you know, quite a lot of play in the past. And essentially, the theory is twofold. On the one hand, Seismitoad is a powerful deck that's going to beat most stuff. Oh, it doesn't beat Verizian Genesect. Good news is Pyro does. There we go. Pyro takes care of Verizian Genesect. That's my worst matchup out of the way. The other theory is, heck, if I'm going to lock them, let's lock them. I can either use Pyro's ability to stop them attacking with basic Pokemon, auto wins against stuff like Plasma, and it's it's really good against Evil Tal, etc, etc, or I can just lock them with Seismitoad. If I come across something like Metal, oh, I'm not going to be able to beat this Metal. Hang on a second, Pyro's going to run straight through it. Life is good. So... You know, there's a lot of uses for Pyro there. It can be kind of a, kind of like a pick your poison lock. Either I'm going to lock you out of basic Pokemon, or I'm going to lock you out of trainers. Either way, yo screwed. The other thing that we can do with Seismitoad here is, um, you know, like I say, just play Seismitoad. And, you know, if you come across Rizzy and Genesect, well, there we go. You've got an answer to it. Now, one guy that sees play as an alternate attacker here, and he's really been seeing play with Seismitoad since the very beginning, and, you know, hardly surprising, he's seen play in an awful lot of decks, and that's Mewtwo. Mewtwo has X-Ball, uh, it does 20 damage times the amount of energy attached to both active Pokemon for a double colorless. So, something like Evil Tower starts building up a big evil ball, that's okay, I can KO it with Mewtwo. It's also good against opposing Mewtwo's, and Mewtwo can be pretty good against Seismitoad, because it's going to... It's going to two-hit KO as long as they can get a muscle band or a laser or something. Or even just a, you know, it's going to two-hit KO. Because they're going to put two energy on, then they're doing 80, 20, 20, 20, 20. Two energy on each active Pokemon. And then the next turn they're going to do 100 when they attach a third energy. So you put a Mewtwo down and you can kind of counter your opponent's Mewtwo with your own. And then you can get the lock back going afterwards. That's kind of how they were going to break the lock. And now all of a sudden, they can't break the lock. Boo-hoo, what are you going to do about it? 
Uh, there's not really much to say about Mewtwo. Mewtwo's pretty good because he works off double colourless. And Mewtwo is just a good attacker. I mean, the other thing you can do with Mewtwo, of course, is you just lock him with Quaking Punch and then just build up a big Mewtwo on the bench. It's more of a pain since Lissandra became so prevalent. But, you know, maybe even build up two Mewtwo's on the bench and then you can break the lock to come in and get a massive KO. The other thing Mewtwo does, and this is not a kind of... It's not a brilliant attack it's not it's not a brilliant stratagem i suppose but what you can do of course is try and use that against verizium turn one they attach an energy turn two you do 80 20 uh, sorry 40 for your double colorless 20 for theirs uh, grass energy 20 for your muscle band turn two they're going to get off one emerald slash and then you're going to be able to ko them by um you know, then doing 100 damage, because they'll have two energy, you'll have two energy in a muscle band, or a third energy, or whatever. And, in theory, you combine this by popping a head ringer on the Verizian before you do the attack, and then they can't do Emerald Slash, because it's going to take them free energy, and then you've KO'd the Verizian before they've got off an Emerald Slash, and generally, when you're playing against Verizian Genesect, if you can KO the Verizian before they get off an Emerald Slash... I mean, you've basically won the game there and then. That is basically going to hand you the win pretty much straight away, which is nice. It's a nice little bonus. So, they're the classics. There's a couple of newer decks which have come about, one of which is Seismitoad Manectric, and it's a, a deck I've been playing around with a little bit. Now, one thing I don't like about this is that you have to put electric energy in. Manectric has two attacks, one for a colourless energy, which does, or lightning energy, let me just check that. But it's for one energy, and it does 20 to the active Pokemon, and 20 to your opponent's bench, or one of your opponent's bench Pokemon. So it's kind of a 20-20, like a, like a weak Landorus attack, I suppose. Um... The other attack, and it is just for, it's for a colourless energy. The other attack for a lightning and a colourless does 60 damage, or if they've got a tool attached, it does 120. Now, if you're locking them with Seismitoad, they're not going to attach a tool, but of course, you've got Head Ringer, so you're going to put a Head Ringer on them, and then that Head Ringer is going to allow you to, you know, get the KO on them in that way. Um, now, you do have to get rid of the water energy, which means you can't grenade hammer. But a Manectric EX of a Muscle Band is doing 130 damage, and it's doing it for 2 energy, not 3, and it's not doing any residual damage to your bench. So in a lot of ways, it's actually a better attack. Now the bad thing is, Seismitoad's attack, the Grenade Hammer, with a Double Colourless, and a Laser, and a um, Verbank, and yes, I know that's a lot to ask, but with all of that, you're actually doing 180 damage, whereas Manectric, you know, really... You're doing 120 plus 20 for a muscle band plus laser verbank only does 170, which is enough for some EXs, but not all. I mean, it's only 10 less damage, though, and I think it's worth it because it takes one less energy to do it. Now, the massive advantage, and you don't really play the Mega here. You could, but I mostly wouldn't. The attack for the Mega does 110 damage and attaches two basic energy cards from your discard to one of your bench Pokemon. But you don't have water energy, so you're attacking with Manectric, and Manectric only takes two energy anyway, and you're attacking with him. The other thing is, you're going to have to put Manectric EX, a Mega Manectric EX, in your deck, and either give up a turn to evolve, or play the Spirit Link. You see where I'm going with this, it's, um, it's not going to work terribly well, shall we say. So, the thing about Manectric is, it's really, really good against Evil Tower. Against a non-EX Evil Tal, a Muscle Band or a Laser gets the KO for 2 energy. Against an EX Evil Tal, you put a Head Ringer on them and you get the 1 hit KO for 2 energy. It swings the Evil Tal matchup massively in your favour. And if you're in a meta game with a lot of Evil Tal, this is something you want to be considering. The UK, for instance, has an awful lot of Evil Tal. So this is something I'm considering. You can also try the Verizian trick here. Which is, you know, turn one, you do 40 damage with Overrun for one energy and a Muscle Band. Turn two, you do 140 damage with Assault Laser for two energy and a Muscle Band. And if you've got a Head Ringer on them, then that means they're not going to be able to um, 
use Emerald Slash before you've got the KO. It's not a massive, you know, it, this isn't some perfect way to beat Frizzy and Genesect, but if you're just playing the classic 2-2 Garbodor line and 2 Seismitoad, you are going to lose to Frizzy and Genesect unless you get some ridiculous, crazy start. And I don't think that's something you can really be relying on. Playing something like a Mewtwo or a Manectric to try and, you know, use Head Ringer and 2-hit Kira the Verizian before they get off a uh, an Emerald Slash is far from a perfect plan. But, you know, it's better than sitting there hoping they draw rubbish, which is, to be honest, a lot of what happens when you're playing one of these classic Seismitoad decks. Now, there's one other way. And this is... Oh, no, wait, just very quickly. I mentioned this in a previous podcast. Driftblim. You play um, Seismitoad, but you take out the, the Garbodor line, you put in Driftblim. You could still play this with a couple of Manectric if you wanted, because you're rolling with colourless energy anyway. Or you could stick in Mewtwo or Charizard or anything like that. But instead of playing, say, a 2-2 Garbodor line, you play a 2-2 Driftblim line. The one that does 50 damage times the amount of special energy in your opponent's discard pile. All the good... Um, Seismitoad decks are playing uh, Enhanced Hammer anyway, so it really doesn't, you know, you're going to be getting rid of their special energy. Really good against decks like Donphan, which revolve around special energy, or maybe something like, I don't know, let's go for Aromatis, which again often relies upon um, uh, special energy unless they're going for the pure pick the pure fairy variant. But outside of that, to be perfectly honest with you, there are a lot of decks it doesn't do much against. But then again, Evil Tower, you get rid of three of their DCE, stick a muscle band on, you're doing 170 for one energy. It's a nice little kind of alternate attacker, which is really good in some decks. And most decks, even something like Frizzy and Genesect, plays plasma energy. And yes, they're going to make a concerted effort to not play down that plasma energy. Of course they are. But they might have to Juniper it, or they might have to lay it down and hope you don't have an Enhanced Hammer. Now the other way to play it, and I'm, I, I don't, I don't know if I can get on board with this decker or not, but it's been seeing an awful lot of success at cities, and I've heard of several people winning with it. It's Seismitoad Slurpluff. Now it's Slurpluff from Phantom Forces, and if you've not heard of this deck, and I've t- I did tell you about this when I went through my Phantom Forces roundup, but if you haven't kind of heard about this deck, you've probably forgotten what Slurpluff does. It's got one attack for a fairy and a double colorless, and spoiler alert, we ain't using that attack, we ain't putting fairy energy into our deck. But it's got an ability called Tasting. Once during your turn, before you attack, you may draw a card. If this Pokemon is your active Pokemon, draw one more card. So, you know, anytime anything gets knocked out, you put it active and draw two cards. And the theory here is, you just play Seismitoad Slurpluff. Four Seismitoad and a 2-2 or a 3-3 Slurpluff line. And then you play your lasers and your Verbank and your Crushing Hammer and your Enhanced Hammer. And then you play probably... um. Lissandra's trump card to put it all back in again and get going, etc, etc. It's a... It's a really quite interesting card. Now, what I don't like about this is that in order to kind of get all these fancy cards into your deck, you're going to be have to... You're going to have to be skimping on some consistency a little bit. You're not going to be playing loads and loads of supporters, and it relies on getting your slurp bluff out early. If you play against a Garbodor, or you, um... You know, and you can't find your megaphone, or you're playing again in a mirror match against Seismitoad, you can't use your megaphone, or you're playing, you know, you can't get Slurpluff out, and you can end up having a, a bit of a drought here. But if you don't, as soon as you get Slurpluffs out, you're drawing two or three cards per turn. If you don't have a supporter, you're probably going to draw into one with Slurpluff. And essentially what you do here is you give yourself options. Crushing Hammer, or Enhanced Hammer, Laser... You can even play things like, you know, Team Flare Grunt to discard an energy attached to the active and a bunch of VS Seeker. You're going to play a bunch of Lissandra and VS Seeker. And like I say, you'll probably play Lissandra's trump card because you don't really need to kind of keep the special energy off. You're just trying to slow them down and waste energy attachments. So you get rid of their energy and then you recycle all of your hammers. Yeah, they get their energy back, but you get your hammers back and you're slowing them down. It's an interesting deck. It's an imaginative deck, and it's one which I... The only reason I don't like it is because of potential lack of early game consistency. Because if you're playing all the text and you're playing Slurpluff, you're probably skimping somewhere on support and stuff like that. But having said that, to be perfectly honest with you, do you really need much more than that? 
I would argue not. So that's Slurpluff and Seismitoad. It's a pretty interesting little deck. And I think we're going to leave my neck trick till next week at this stage. I've told you about some, uh, some of the, the first kind of release Team Aqua and Team Magma Pokemon. And we've had a good discussion about Seismitoad and all its possible partners. My neck trick, um, Mewtwo, Charizard, Garbodor, Slurpluff, Driftblim, Pyroar, etc, etc. I'm currently testing a bunch of Seismitoad lists. I can find a deck I like this format. So I've decided to just go with Seismitoad. The problem is I can't decide between a really straightforward Seismitoad Garbodor or Seismitoad Driftblim or Seismitoad Garbodor Manectric or Seismitoad Pyro. So I suppose I'm just going to be testing a bunch of them over the next couple of days. I quite like the idea of playing Seismitoad Pyro just so it can give me a much easier matchup against something like Verizian Genesect or... um. Uh, excuse me, or um, Metal, because I hate that Metal deck. Haven't beaten it yet. Only played it once. Rage quit. We've heard that story. So yeah, that's Seismitoad. Next week we're going to be back. We're going to be talking about Manectric and all of its forms, catching you up on the latest news. Hopefully we'll have some more cards revealed, and maybe we'll start going through cities and what's been winning at cities and all of that. I know my YouTube has been a little bit neglected over the last couple of weeks. Uh, that's been because of... All of my technical problems, they are now getting sorted out, so hopefully we'll have more on that in the future. I am hoping this podcast audio quality has been slightly better than usual. Instead of using a cheap kind of 15, 20 quid headset, I'm using an 80 pound microphone I borrowed from work. I'm hoping that's given me a better quality of audio sound. It might be an air ever so slightly quieter, but that's probably going to be a good thing because we're no longer kind of reaching the limits of the file like we were before. Clipping, I believe they call it. Anyway, let me know what you thought about the audio quality. Make sure you tweet me at the WASI. Email me at ptcgradio at hotmail.co.uk. And if you have not done so already, subscribe to me on YouTube. Just search for PTCG Radio on YouTube or Google PTCG Radio YouTube. You'll find it very, very easily. Subscribe, watch the videos, like, comment, all of that good stuff. As always, thank you very much for listening. Look after yourselves till next week. My name's Ross and you've been listening to PTCG Radio. <laughs>